Good morning and happy Sabbath, church family. And welcome to those online. We are glad you all are here on this beautiful Sabbath day to worship the Lord. Before we, I'm going I'm to read you a verse here in a moment, but before we do, why don't we have a word of prayer and ask the Lord's presence to be with us today. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we come to you in prayer, thanking you for this beautiful, beautiful Sabbath day that you've given us, Lord. We thank you for your love for us, Lord, for your protection through the week, Lord, for the beautiful weather you've given us here in this area. And Lord, but we also have many things on our heart, Lord, that we want to pray for, pray for all those dealing with the pandemic that is circling our globe at this point, Lord, but we know that you are in control. May you give peace and comfort to those dealing with this, Lord. And most of all, as we worship you today in spirit and in truth, I pray that your presence would be with us. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Just had a verse I wanted to read, actually two verses I wanted to read you all this morning. Um, the first one is found in Psalms chapter 27 and verse 4. This is David speaking, and he says, One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after. I don't know if you guys know what comes next. I'm sure you do. It's a familiar verse, and what it says is, That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. You know, I was thinking, a lot of people, for those watching online and, and those that may see it later on online, you know, they're not able to be, as it were, in a house of the Lord, in a worship setting. But you know what I was thinking? What, where do we see Jesus? Or where is his, what is a place, a temple or a place of worship? Well, we see that it's wherever his presence is. So that means that in your home, wherever you're watching from, wherever you may see this or in the future be, that as long as you are asking for the presence of the Lord, that can be in, being in his temple, being in his presence. And, that, and he wants to dwell with us. I want to go to another verse, Exodus chapter 25 and verse 8. It says, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So it's something the Lord wants to do. I love how David here in, in uh, Psalms is talking about how he, wants the Lord, how he wants to dwell in the house of the Lord. The Lord's like, I want to dwell with you. So it's a mutual thing. And I pray that that is our, what, what we want, that we want the Lord to dwell with us today. And also wherever you may be watching online, the Lord can be there. You can ask for his presence and he wants to be there with you. So I pray that we each are wanting his presence. Um, another thing is, if you have any prayer requests for those online, please send prayer requests to prayer. That is regular spelling of prayer at Washita, I'm sorry, at ohc.org. So that's prayer at Washita Hills College or just ohc.org. Also, you can say it in the comments there in the live stream, and we will lift those up further at further notice. Um, at this point, Thomas is going to be sharing something that the Lord has placed on his heart. May you have a blessed Sabbath. <laughs> um, first, I want to apologize for my English because it's my third language. <laughs> so when I left Guatemala, I didn't know any English and any Spanish, so I have to learn them at the same time. It's a very little difficult for me, but I'm still learning. Uh, today I want to share you a part of my testimony, how God saved me from death and heals me. It is better to make good decisions instead of receiving the consequences. Sometimes we wait until something happens to us to, be, to learn a lesson. Um, last year, October 17, I was living in Mississippi, living the daily life, working. Uh, it was on Thursday. I used to have two jobs back then. Um, when I get out on the board on Thursday with somebody else, and he asked me to give him a ride to take him back home, and I told him that I can give him that right, but um, during that day, uh, during that uh, year, I, I don't even go to church, I don't even read my Bible, and I don't even pray, so I used to be doing bad stuff, I used to drink, to smoke, to consume cocaine, so it was uh, a rough time, so when I was taking him back home, and he was like, hey, uh, let's go get some drinks. And I'm like, yeah. And we went to get the drinks, and after that, I told him that uh, 
this is it. Uh, I have to go back home to change because I have to work. And I went back home to, to change. And when I was, when we are on our way to, to go in his home, uh, he was like, uh, what if we go, go, what if we go for some more drinks? And I was like, no, uh, man, no, I, I have to work. He was like, why do you have to work if you have this job and, and that? And I was getting paid 1000 or 900 per week in that moment. So I was like, you're right, uh, I don't need to work. So we went to for more drinks, and we started drinking, smoking, and we went to hang out with some more friends. And in that same day, it was getting late. And we, and I told him that uh, it's getting late, so let's go back home. And when we are in our way home, we got like a car break. Uh, we didn't make it home. Yeah, um, all I remember is uh, knocking somebody else's door, asking for, for help. And they opened the door for me. They took me inside their house and laid me down on the couch. And they, they started asking questions of me, of me, to me, if I'm by myself or I have somebody else in the car. And I told them that uh, I have one more person in the car. And they, and I start, and they start uh, saying that uh, the car is getting, uh, is getting fire on the car. So, and that's all I remember. And the next day, uh, I wake up in the hospital, in the ICU hospital. And the first thing I ask them is, uh, where can I find my friend? Where can I see him? And they told me that, uh, you really want to know all your friends? I'm your friend? And I'm like, yes. But uh, they were like, uh, that car blew up and he died. So it was uh, hard for me, and I was like, why him and not me? Because I was the one who was traveling. And all of that, I was so, so confused. But, and they, they took me to the x-ray during that day. And when they got the result, they told me that uh, you broke your neck, you broke your shoulder, you have blood in your brain, and you broke your spine, spine, that's how you say it. And I was like, and they say like, uh, there's a 50% chance that you're not going to be able to walk again. So I think you stay in the wheelchair. And I was like, what's the point to being alive if I'm not going to be able to walk to that? And, and that day, uh, my mom comes and she was like, uh, she started crying and she was like, what you do, look what you did. And I've been telling you so many times not to doing that and that, and there's nothing we can do. I think uh, you're going to the jail. And I was start crying and we start praying with her. And I was praying to, Lord, to the Lord and crying, asking that, um, I was like, Lord, just give me one more chance. Give me one more opportunity, and I, I, I do whatever you want me to do. And that time, he, he didn't answer my prayer, but... Um, and then on the next day, on Sabbath, they took me again to the x-ray to make sure where they're going to do the surgery, because they're going to do the surgery on my back, on my shoulder, on my neck, and on my brain. And they took me again, and I mean, I was there, like, for two or three hours, and they, when they finally got the result, they, they the doctors, they were uh, surprised, and they don't know what to say, and I was like, what, what happened? I think I'm going to, I'm not going to be able to walk, or I don't know, and they were like, only God knows, and I was like, what, what you mean? And they say that, uh, you, you don't have anything broken. 
uh, we're not going to do the surgery on you. You are good to go home. And at the same day, they sent me back home. I was uh, so happy, but I was still thinking about my friend, what's going to happen to me. And when I was still in the hospital, the police came and he was like, I'm just here to tell you that uh, the car blew up and your friend dies and there's nothing you can do about it. So, and he left. And I went back home and on Sunday, I started reading my Bible and I found this verse on Psalms 118, 118 verse 17 and 18. Um, it says like that. I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me sore, but he had not given me over unto death. Amen. And I understand that uh, the Lord has a plan and a mission for me and a purpose. Because, like, can you imagine with your back uh, being broken and walking in the, during the accident? It was only the Lord. So at that same day, I was uh, happy and all of that. But in the afternoon, Three cars of the police came at my home, and then uh, my mom says, I think they are here for you <laughs> to take you to the jail. <laughs> and I would start crying and praying for the, to the Lord, and they went into, inside the house, and they, they uh, said that to me, and we want you to be honest and sincere to us, tell us and all what you did in that day. And I, I tell him that uh, I went to work and all of that, and they were like, uh, we appreciate your honesty. And I started asking them what's going to happen to me, what's next. And they were like, it's not uh, your fault, it's not a crime. Any accident can happen any time. And they told me that uh, don't do that bad stuff again and go to church. and to God. So they left and, and that's and during the, the December, during November and December, uh, I figured out that I don't have any friends. The only friend I have is Jesus. Amen. So during that two months, it was uh, two months of reflect for me. Um, one day, I pick up the phone and call Miss Marga if I can still come to school, and she said that uh, I can still come on January because I was supposed to come on August last year, in the first semester, but I didn't come because I was earning 1,000 or 900 per week, and I was like, why do I need to go to college? <laughs> but yeah, so that's why I'm here now, studying for theology, and I'm ready, yeah. Oh. Uh, if you didn't get anything on that, I want you to get this. Uh, don't wait until you are in the hospital. Don't wait until you are in pain. Don't wait until something happens to you to come to God. Amen. Okay, good morning. I'd like to call for the participants in the Sabbath School panel to come up. And while they're coming up, welcome to uh, our students here, our staff, and of course, those of you that are live streaming with us. We're glad that you're prepared to study the Word of God with us together. And so let's see. We have here, okay, good, come on up, great. Christopher Miller, Jensen Rood, and Dr. Kathy Rosari. Thank you so much for being available. My name is Sam Soler, and I'll be moderating today. All right, so let's go ahead and get into our lesson. Did you enjoy the lesson, by the way? Yes. Okay, and I'm going to use my handy iPad. You know, last week, um, we considered the uniqueness of the Bible. What an amazing book the sacred scriptures are and we had determined that the scripture is more than good literature amen yeah. 
Mm -hmm. uh, it's more than a philosophical commentary. It is an accurate history of our origins and an unfolding revelation of God's interaction with us. That being said, this week's lesson focuses on how we got the Bible, its origins, and how does God communicate with us. By the way, students, we're looking forward to your comments. There's mics on the side there, and uh, if you would join us for commentary or questions, okay? So let's get into this then. Um, my first question for you is briefly, does it matter whether we understand how God communicates with humanity? You know, there are people who believe that, uh, you know, you look in a, the bottom of a cup at tea leaves and somehow God is supposed to speak to you. Others look up at the stars and the constellations, some in crystal balls. Does it matter how God speaks to us? Yeah, it matters tremendously. Okay. Um, there are entire movements and whose foundation is that this is exactly what God said, and if you change it, even by an iota, like translating it even, it is wrong. And so you must learn the original language to properly understand what God says. That's a very different belief than what we typically consider. So yes, it has profound differences. It's, it's so important because it helps, it either gives or takes away credibility how it is transmitted. And what the Lord did gives tremendous credibility. That's crucial, isn't it? In other words, how do we know that God is really speaking? Maybe the method is authenticating, okay? Anybody can say, well, I think I have a message from God, but does it fit the criteria? Okay, good. Any, any other thoughts? I was going to say the story of uh, Saul when he went to the Witch of Endor, I think is a good example because the Witch of Endor was a medium through which he could receive information, but it wasn't the right information. And so there's many ways that we can receive information, but we have to realize that there's different sources to receive information from, and the Bible is the only way that we can know that information is coming from God and not from somewhere else. Yes, that's right. I have to confess, Jensen, when I knew you were going to be on the panel, I thought of computers and you know, how that you have this stream of information on the internet, how does something get from one specific location to another? And, um, you know, how do we know it's the right information, that it's not just coming from hither and yon? Um, there is, whenever the internet sends out information, or rather, a server, sorry. So, basically, your computer talks to another computer and says, hey, I want this file. And so, in that request, there is a wrapper around it. It's like oh. a candy wrapper. And every time it goes through a junction in the internet, it puts on another wrapper. And then, when, it, when it's coming back, it basically unwraps it. And so, it knows where to go because of what was bound around there in the first place. Um, and so, we know it's from the right place because it has identifying marks all over every step of the way and it comes back from whence it came. Um, now, there are attacks where called man-in-the-middle attacks where uh -huh. somebody tries to hijack that. <laughs> Thankfully, they're fairly difficult. I don't know. He, I, I know nothing about that. I mean, that's mystery. That's new stuff to me. But it made me think of the, the rappers help give the identity. What we find in the word gives identity. There's such a consistency between our Savior, who the whole Bible is about, over all those years, uh, there's, there's a wrapper there. We see things. We see a consistency that just really speaks to the authenticity of the word. Yeah, and that's the thing that stands out to me is there has to be some way of authenticating, you know? So there's smoke coming up in the sky. Is that a fire? Is somebody sending smoke signals? It, you know. It, this is indefinite, but with the Word of God, there has to be some way to authenticate it so that we know. We know that it is God speaking to us and not just something random or some other source other than God. Okay. If I could 
expand the wrapper illustration. Sure. Um, the original foundation of everything we have in Scripture <clears throat> is what was written by God himself, namely the Ten Commandments. That is the word he wrote with his very own finger, not human-made. The rest of the Bible is a continuous wrapper around it, building off of that God-written Scripture. And it must agree with that inner core, or else it is useless. Okay. Let's go ahead and get into some of the ways that God's, how God speaks to us, how the word originates, how the wrapper or whatever authenticating thing happens, okay? And let's move into Sunday, Monday. And we're going to, kind of, Chris, you've got to comment. mention a verse. Please. In yeah. Isaiah 8.20, it says, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Hmm. And so I think that's the authentication that we have for where the light is coming from. Okay. We might even, of course, have to ask, where do we get that primary word which then we use to test other things from? So let's talk about it. How is it that we know God is communicating to us? How does his word come to us? Let's go to Sunday, Sunday, Monday. We're going to kind of do this together. Um, and uh, let's explore how we get the word of God from God. Let's, I'd like to turn our attention, first of all, to Amos uh, chapter 3, verse 7. I wonder if someone could look that up for us. And then we'll ask a question after we read it. <clears throat> Amos chapter 3, verse 7. And those of you that are with us in the audience here, you can open your Bibles and be blessed by this word from God. Okay, Dr. Kathy, you're ready. Go yes. ahead. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but <clears throat> he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Okay, let's look at that a little bit. By the way, I love this verse because... It, it reveals something about God. He wants to reveal his secrets. Did you catch that? Mm. God does nothing, but he will, in fact, reveal his secrets. So, but now here's my, here's my question. What does the term reveal mean when it says he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets? We'll, we'll kind of look at each piece of that. Reveal. What does that mean? make something known that wasn't known okay something that is maybe not readily available he's going to take it through a process where it becomes available to us what else anything else do do we have are you familiar we're all familiar with the term revelation right okay so god reveals and the process is revelation any other thoughts there oh i see someone up okay Hebrew word gala literally means to uncover. Good. It's something that's there, you just can't see it yet. Okay. And God uncovers it for us, reveals it to us. Okay. And there may be reasons why it's uncovered, our human limitations, etc. Okay. Anything else there? So God is going to uncover, make known something that's not necessarily readily available to us. Why might stuff not be readily available to us? I think one of the reasons is our own um, mindset. We might not be in a readiness to enter in and to hear it. We have to believe that the word is God's word for things to make sense as we are revealed. We might have biases that prevent. Okay, Jensen? Um, I think of it like our eyes because Visible light is a certain wavelength. And if it's outside of that wavelength, our eyes just don't pick it up. We're not constructed. We just don't have the equipment to actually see it. Sure. So, I mean, there's infrared light. There's ultraviolet light all around us. We have no clue because we're just not built that way. Um, we have limitations. God knows <clears throat> that. And so to get things across to us that we just can't see, he has to tell us directly. Hmm. Some use the illustration of the radio. You know, we can't pick up those waves, but the radio can, and it has to be tuned. I think we've got a comment here, and then we'll come back here. Yeah, a verse that comes to my mind in John 15, 15, Jesus said, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. 
for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. And it kind of just brings to my mind, my closest friends, I tell them things that I wouldn't tell to just anyone else. The reason why is because I know that I can trust them. I know that when I share this information with them, it will be safe. And even when you look at the book of Revelation, there's certain things that not everyone can just look at the book of Revelation and just understand until they start having a relationship with God and they get to understand him because then they won't use that information for a bad purpose. But when we really become the friends of God, then it's like, I can reveal things to you because I know you're actually gonna use this information for a good purpose. We're gonna focus in on that very idea, but first, uh, Pastor Dale. Yeah, the text that came to my, to my mind is 1 Corinthians uh, 2.14, where it says, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. Mm. If I can add to what Moboshi said, though, I. Like what he brought out, because I've used this following illustration as to why Revelation is written in code. I was doing a sermon one time. I, I did some research on the the code talkers of the World War II. Mm -hmm. They chose the Navajo language because hardly anybody knows it except the family, the Navajo family. Mm -hmm. And I apply that to the Bible. See, you have to be part of God's family. You have to be one of the children of God to be able to understand these symbols kind of like the Navajos have to be part of their tribe to understand that language. That's beautiful. So you have to be in right relationship with God. Uh, obviously, you know, we know the saying, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. And so we have to be in a right relationship with the revealer. Um, can I add human limitations, ignorance, um, biases, et cetera, et cetera? Those are all things that limit us in the revelation process, so we need help. Now, look at the, the, the next part of the verse. God reveals his secrets to whom? His servants. To his servants, the prophets. And uh, so here's kind of a, a challenging question. Why prophets? Why not just any old person? It seems to me, I'm sorry, <laughs> it seems to me that the very word prophet, the very um, role of a prophet, it's not that someone is first a prophet and then the Lord reveals them, it's that he has chosen someone to be the one he will reveal special things to. So that is, it, it's kind of put together. Um, it couldn't be anyone that he chooses, but once he's chosen for a prophet, it's to reveal special things for them to then transmit to others. Okay. You don't want to be a prophet, honestly. <laughs> um, prophets have an extremely difficult life. They have to tell people plainly to their face things that they never, ever want to hear, like, you're going to die. That's a heavy message to deliver to some people. Um, they are held up to excruciatingly high standards. Um, and the slightest the slightest misplaced word can be misconstrued completely. It's a very difficult life. Not everyone is suited for that life. And I am thankful I am not a prophet, honestly. So they reveal bad news for us and of course, good news as well. I think one reason that God used prophets is because prophets translate the message from God to the people. And the way that the message comes through, not just the actual information can change how it's received. And I think of like a translator. Um, sometimes you can, you can be preaching a message yes. and you're getting excited about this verse and then the translator, they get the message and they're very calm and unimpassioned. And when they deliver it, it doesn't come across with the same meaning you intended it to. And so even though they're speaking the same words, the people aren't getting the same, the same impact. Sure. And I believe it's the same way with prophets. And so God has to choose somebody that's going to deliver his message not just the words, but actually in the way that he wants it to be delivered. I like that example. So the, the, the prophet is a translator in the sense that he understands God's language as well as man's language. You know, have you been, a, no doubt, you visited different countries and you run into someone at a store or wherever, at the airport, and you try with your broken or whatever to try language to try to get a communication, they start speaking to you in their language as if you're an old friend, saying, oh yeah, sure, you just go here and you go there and you do this and that. I don't understand. In comes the translator. 
all is well. They know both sides. Mm. Good. I'd like to look at another verse. Well, okay, we do have someone here. Thank yes. you. Um, I would say that another thing here that I see is a, a manner of organization of God. Um, in Revelation uh, chapter 1, for example, we have the, the verse that starts by saying the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must surely come to pass. So when you combine both these verses right here and some passages in Spirit of Prophecy and all the verses in the Bible where you see angels that God chooses to reveal things to the prophets, I see seven points in Revelation. The fathers to the Son to the Holy Spirit, and then the Holy Spirit to the angels, the angels to the prophets, that's five, and church to the world, that's seven. So it's a manner of organization, and the way that God has it is so organized that he is able to not lose his, uh, his message, or at least like uh, the message is not perverted in that way because it's so organized. It's not like a person here receives one thing, the other person there receives one thing, but we have this train that it must continue going down uh, that, that, that same line. Mm -hmm. And the other verse that came to mind is, is uh, Psalms 25, 14, where God says, The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. Very, very powerful verse. Yes. I'm going to leave it there. You guys can come in more. Let's on. add, no, let's add to that very idea. Let's go together to 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 through 21, because I think they really focus in on this very point. There is something about the prophets that makes them the ideal and, in fact, the necessary intermediaries, if you will. Okay? We talked about language. That's, that's, I think, an important concept, understanding. But uh, who can read that for us? First Peter, excuse me, Second Peter chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. Chris, mm -hmm. thank you. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, <clears throat> whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now there's so much in, that, in those verses, but um, am I still on? Can you hear me? Yeah. But what I want you to focus on, if you would, is that, that concept, holy men. What does that imply about the messenger. I think that the word holy, we think of it always as, um, it means chosen for a separal, se special office. Right. And so these are specially chosen people. The Lord doesn't just um, come to any random person. He knows the heart of the person before he speaks to them. But that doesn't take away free will because we have, even in our, with our modern prophet, we have examples of people that did not accept the prophetic call. So they, and certainly uh, Jonah intended to refuse. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and finally did. But they're, they're specially chosen of the Lord. So they're set apart for special use, holy men. Yeah, some even turned their back on God, like Balaam. That's right. However, there's something about their experience that, that is referred to as holy. Anything else on that? Why would God look for holy humans, so to speak? <laughs> Going back to the translator illustration, I, when you have a translator that understands your feeling when you're communicating, they're able to communicate the same message in the same way. And so they have to understand you in order to communicate your message. And I believe that's why there needs to be holy men chosen as prophets because it's only by being in contact with God that we can be holy. And to understand God is the only way that you can communicate his message in the way that he wants it to be received. Okay. Going back to Kathy's thought, holy, set apart for special use. <clears throat> the word that runs in my mind when I think of holy is dedicated, consecrated. Not perfect, but absolutely consecrated perfect. Um, I think of Jesus' disciples. He had how many disciples? Twelve. 
12, but how many were in his inner circle? Three. Three. And we know that those three were in his inner circle, not because they were smarter than the rest. There were others that were more qualified, if you will. But these were ones that hungered and thirsted uh, even more so than the others. And so they were brought into that consecrated circle, if you will. And God revealed, uh, Jesus reveals special things to them that others didn't get to see. I think that concept is there. The dedication of the servant makes them accessible, trainable, moldable, uh, communicable for that purpose. Holy men, women, children of God. At least that's the way it strikes me. Okay, let's continue. Um, uh, let's see, what do we have here? Okay, yes, please. I was going to ask a question. How do any of us become holy? You may recall the rich young ruler came to Jesus, and good teacher, what must I do? And Jesus, the first words out of Jesus' mouth were, why do you call me good? Only one is good, that is God alone. Now, if that is true, which I believe it is, none of us can be good except we have God within us. That means conversion. Mm -hmm. That means we've received Christ and become a child of God. That, that's what it means. That's, that's what these people are. They're, they've been born again. They've been, they've been converted. They're not the natural man anymore. Mm -hmm. They're a spiritual person. Yeah. You know, a question that comes to mind when we think about God choosing to use holy humans as opposed to just anybody. Um, imagine that you were at home and there was a knock at your door and someone was there. I won't describe this someone, but they say to you, I'm here with a message for you. And the message is that you must stay home for the next month because of the COVID outbreak by order of the governor of the state. What would you want to know about that individual? What is their authority? Ah, okay. What is their authority? What is their relationship with the governor? Okay, good. I think, again, this may help us to understand that while God wants to reveal his secrets to all of us, he does it through the prophets because he has people that are consecrated, dedicated, trained, qualified. If a guy showed up with a police outfit, I'd be more likely, you know, to trust him than I would if, uh, you know, he showed up in a, in a clown suit <laughs> or something like that. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, Chris. And it also reflects on the person giving the message in the presentation of the messenger. If somebody comes from the president's office dressed in a t-shirt and flip-flops and shorts, they're saying something about the president. And so God has to use men that are going to represent him properly in giving his message. Very good. That is so true. No? No thoughts. Okay, so it tells us that holy men of old were moved by the Holy Spirit. What does the moving imply? What's, what are we talking about there? It seems, yeah, moved by the Holy Spirit. It seems that there the Holy Spirit has impressed them with a message. And they've been moved by the Holy Spirit. But okay. I think maybe Maboshi was going to speak. Yes, go ahead, Maboshi. No, I, I didn't mean to jump back to the previous topic. Go ahead. But something just came to my mind when you gave that illustration. Um, Jesus came from heaven, and there was, we know that there was no beauty in him that he should be desired. And that's not necessarily saying that he was unattractive. It's but he. To the mic. Okay. Sorry, so I'll repeat. So basically, Jesus was sent down from heaven by his father, and he knew the father more than any, anyone. And there was no beauty in him that he should be desired, so he wasn't the most attractive person to, he wasn't the person that people were expecting to come and send a message from God. But like Chris was saying, his character was so amazing. And they noticed that even though he didn't have rank, like the way people were thinking he would, or thinking a Messiah would come, he was loving, he was kind, he was tender, he was very caring for everyone. So when he was com communicating a message to people, they were like, I, 
think we can trust this guy. Like, I think there's something here that we can actually trust versus the Pharisees who had all of the reputation, who had the rank, but because of the way they acted and the way they conducted themselves, the people did weren't as ready to hear or receive the message in their hearts from those people. So that's just a thought that came to mind. Sure, again, you're referring to the authenticating factor. In the case of Christ, it was his character, his words. You know, uh, we think of the testimony of some of the people that said, he has the words of life. They, they just could tell that. And so whether it's a farmer like Amos or a prince like Isaiah, there's some authenticating factor that shows that it's a connection with heaven as opposed to just mere human speculation. Pastor Dale. Uh, again, the original word there is uh, pharaoh, I think it is, I don't know how pronounced in Greek. Okay. Uh, the first definition is to carry. There's a long list here, to carry. And it makes me think of an Isaiah, how Isaiah contrasts the idols of the day. You have to carry them around their burden, whereas God carries you as a child of God. So it's someone who, who relies upon God, who trusts fully in him, to take him wherever he'll go and not question it. There's something else that uh, moves me about the word moves. <laughs> um, they were moved by the Holy Spirit. How do we know they were moved? What, what might be, in other words, what, what are authenticating factors um, that they were moved by the Holy Spirit as opposed to just human speculation? Did you catch it? Go ahead. I think in the verse right before it, it says, no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. So that means that if one person was moved by the Holy Spirit, there should be confirmation in other people that share the same idea. And so no one person is moved by themselves. There needs to be other people to verify that this is what I received as well. So a confirmation may be to the law and testimony. They speak according to this word. Mm -hmm. Okay, what else? Pretty much I was going to, you just said it, the, the consistency with the body of Scripture, the consistency with, with others, the word given, especially pertaining to Christ, which is the whole Scripture, is going to have a consistency. It's not going to disagree with another portion that has been moved by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we have one, but I, I believe, friends, and we haven't quite hit there yet, what are some other authenticating factors that men and women were moved by the Holy Spirit to the, to the long testimony. Uh, he starts out by saying that we have the prophetic, prophetic word confirmed. Made more sure, yes. If you look at the context, he's talking about Jesus. He's talking about Jesus. Jesus confirmed the word, didn't he? Okay. So the prophetic word he's referring to is the word that predicted everything about Christ's life that came true. Mm -hmm. So if this prophet, his words came true, we know he was moved upon by the Holy Spirit, don't we? Beautiful. So it has to testify of Jesus. Yes. Um, I was thinking the purpose. Their purposes would align and they would um, develop the fruits of the Spirit as well. They would manifest the fruit of the Spirit. It would be in alignment. Good. Anything else? Do we have what we call tests for a prophet? Mm -hmm. What are some of those tests? Yes. Well, one of the tests is the testimony of their life. Like um, Elizabeth just mentioned, the fruits of the Spirit. Right. Sure. I know that in, one of, in a future lesson, we're going to be digging into this much deeper. But, you know, when prophets uh, are impacted by the Holy Spirit, is there evidence? They're speaking to the law and to the testimony. We've covered that. What else? That's kind of what Pastor Dale was talking about. Anything else? You know, I'm, I'm, I'll tell you why I'm fishing. Go ahead, Maboshe. Um, I don't know if you're fishing for this one, but I think <laughs> of Elisha. Okay. Um, as soon as he was, I guess, the, the mantle was passed on to him, yes. supernatural things began to take place. Yes. And you think of different prophets, there's an evidence of a supernatural interacting with them. Mm-hmm. This is exactly it. There has to be some evidence that it's coming from a higher authority than just human speculation. 
often accompanied by supernatural manifestation. Yes, Pastor. Dave, I think you're referring to 1 John 4, probably, right? Where, you are, mm -hmm. where it says, uh, but this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And that speaks to me of understanding the, the nature of Christ's incarnation. Because there's a lot of strange ideas about that today, isn't there? Do the spirit, does this person understand about Christ, how he came, and what that means for us? One more text here, and then we're going to move into a whole new field. Look with, let's look together at 2 Timothy chapter 3 um, and verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Dr. Carlos. And to your question about the test of a prophet, yes. um, in Deuteronomy 18.22, uh, this is not the ultimate test, but it is a test. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken, but the prophet has spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. So what the prophet says will come to pass, and that fits into the context in the letter of Peter, where it talks about the more sure word of prophecy. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, my concern is, you know, I come from a world where spirit, out of spiritualism where anybody and everybody would say, I have a word from God. And so how do we know it has to be to the law and to the testimony? The fruit test, you know, several of these things, but there always has to be, or there can be and should be some supernatural manifestation that attests to it as well. Even if it's just that the prophecy comes to pass. Very good, yes. Okay. Um, something else I was going to say too is uh, when God speaks, his word has power to change our hearts. Amen. And one of the evidences of a prophet's work that is coming from God is the change that it has on people's lives. Thank you. Anybody have uh, 2 Timothy 3.16? Dr. Kathy, please. Let's... All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. You want me to read 17? It goes with it. Sure. <laughs> that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Okay, so notice that the word of God is, uh, the prophets are inspired. That's an interesting word. In the Greek, it's God breathed, mm -hmm. is what the term means. Again, there's the supernatural element of it. It's not human speculation, it's divine revelation. And what is the role of the Holy Spirit in the revelation process? What are your thoughts? That's a big question. It is, we only have a, a few minutes, but it looks like Dr. Carlos is ready to help us. Well, as you've been talking about that particular verse, how the holy men of God were moved by the Holy Spirit, um, moving implies movement, <laughs> going from point A to point B, from point one to two. So something actually transfers the prophet. What, what actually happens? It's that the Holy Spirit works on this individual, and the individual has a change. And it, it comes out in writing, he expresses it or speaks. Um, I thought Miriam Webster had a really, really good definition for inspiration. It says, a divine influence or action on a person believed to qualify him or her to receive and communicate sacred revelation. That's terrific. That's really good. Chris. In John chapter 14, verse 26, it says, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So I think pretty clearly there it talks about the work of the Holy Spirit in teaching us, giving us understanding of the things that God has spoken to us. Because when you read the Bible, it's not like a normal book. You can't just read it and understand it. Uh, the understanding comes with the, the spirit that, whose influence you're under while you're reading it. And so there's things that you may not be able to understand, not because you're not intelligent, but it's because you haven't asked the Holy Spirit to give you understanding, to teach you. And so the Holy Spirit gives us understanding and he brings back to our remembrance things that God has taught us when we need it. Beautiful, so the Holy Spirit shows things to God's dedicated messengers because they're, they have their antennas up all the time, right? They're, they're receiving. 
But then the Holy Spirit also is in the process of interpreting to us when we receive the message. Always we need the Holy Spirit's help, yes. I think we always have to keep in mind that heavenly inspiration is not heavenly dictation. You know, we can be inspired by something we see, we still write it down in our own words, right? Mm -hmm. So God inspires people by a vision, maybe like in John, Madeline Patmos, or whatever, some way he communicates something, and the prophet writes it in his own language so his people can understand it, of course. And I think the lesson made a very good point in the fact that this can be something that's already in, in existence. Like Ellen White in Great Controversy used a lot of things from de Beignet and other sources, and people will call her plagiarist, but she's just simply doing what Paul did, quoting the Old Testament so often, you know, in a sense. See, I mean, if I, was, if I was writing this stuff out and I saw something that's accurate according to what God has shown me, I said, why should I reinvent the wheel? Let's go, go ahead and go with this, you know? Mm -hmm. So it, it can be other things like that, like the lesson brings out. The important thing is, again, it's not dictation necessarily. It can be the words of God if God said to say something, but not necessarily. Sometime in the lesson, no doubt, they're going to tackle the big subject of verbal inspiration versus thought inspiration, and you've just touched on that. But that's, that's a good subject for another time. Elizabeth. Yeah, I just wanted to read um, Acts 1, verses 8. It says, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come unto you, mm -hmm. and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So the Holy Spirit also gives us power, and that power can mean various things depending on, you know, situation. But it's like... Um, to give a understanding of the world of who Jesus truly is as well. Yeah. That is the key, is to reveal Christ. Now, we've got about 10, 15 minutes left and we're gonna have to skip over some of the beautiful things that were here in the lesson, uh, paralleling the, the written word with the living word, Christ. I, I hope you'll go back to that. But I, I wanna end with this question of faith. The question of faith, it's uh, there. We'll see it in Thursday's lesson. Understanding the Bible by faith. And so the question here, it, it, the lesson encourages us to read Hebrews uh, 11, verses 3 and verses 6, and then we'll look at a question. Let's first go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3 and verse 6. We could have a reader for that question, or those texts. Anybody who's ready, just speak up. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And verse 6. Mm -hmm. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a warder of them that diligently seek him. Okay, so clearly from these texts, faith is the human interface or response with the message of the prophets. Would you say? Faith. And so the question is, why is faith so essential in understanding God and his word? Why is it impossible to please God without faith? We might even have to ask before that question, what is faith? I know that's a big one, but what are we talking about when we're talking about faith? I think in a simplistic way, we can say believing it at face value. Just, it is. It is what it says it is. Okay, so God has said something, and, and I trusting it to be truth. at face value. Okay, any other thoughts? Verse 1, where it says, faith is the substance of things hoped for. The word substance in the original Greek means a foundation, among other things. So it becomes the foundation of the things we hope for. It's the basis of it all, you know. And as far as pleasing God, I've had the experience where I'm really honest in telling somebody I love about something and they choose for whatever reason not to trust what I say. I know from personal experience what that feels like. It doesn't do much for the relationship and likewise it doesn't do much for our relationship with God. He's being totally honest and transparent with us. 
If we don't trust him at that, at his word, it damages our relationship with him. Oh my, yes. <clears throat> I've said this before, but I'll repeat it. Uh, it's quite interesting that in Hebrews 11, we have opposites. Some people go to Egypt by faith, and some get out of Egypt by faith. Some people, for example, between uh, Sarah and Abraham, one brings into the world the son of the promise, the other one goes to sacrifice the son of the promise. It's like God is saying, it's not this, it's not that. So what is it? It's not going, it's not staying. Faith is to believe that which God commanded. And I will read just one verse for it. So that's why Paul brings the word uh, pleases. To some people, it was pleasing to God that they went to Egypt. That was faith if they did it. To some people, it was pleasing to God if they left Egypt. And that would be faith if they obeyed the command. So the other thing mentioned is um, reward. Anybody that comes to him has to believe that he's a rewarder. So in Genesis uh, 15, uh, it starts by saying, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. So anything, uh, I mean, all things that God uh, promised to Abraham, all those impossibilities, could only be possible if Abraham would believe that the impossibilities of, of man are actually the possibilities of God. So it is to accept the command that God gives as truth and fact only because God gave it. So it's not necessarily any movements that we make, going to preach or not going to preach, going to watch the hills or in Jews, because we do those things and thinking that's faith. But those are just circumstances that if God is calling and I do it, then that makes it faith, because I believe that he is a reward. Hmm. And of course, as the text was mentioned, faith is based on or founded on evidence that we've already received. Okay, yes. Could you repeat the question? The question we're looking at very quickly is, why is what is faith and why is it essential in understanding God and his word? Hmm. Okay, Kathy, and then we'll come back to the mic. This is from the notes on, on the lesson, and this is an excellent one from uh, Gospel Workers. There's a couple spots here. Faith claims God's promises and brings forth fruit in obedience. Presumption also claims the promises, but uses them as Satan did to excuse transgression. True faith lays hold of and claims the promised blessings before it is realized and felt. True faith rests on the promises contained in the Word of God and those only who obey that word can claim its glorious promises. Thank you, yes. Okay. Yes, I just think of the rich young ruler. Um, when Jesus came to him, he said, you know, in order to, to follow him, you have to keep all the commandments. He said, I've been doing all these things since birth. And the question is, was he doing these things by faith? Outwardly, it might've seemed like he was doing everything, but inwardly, Jesus saw that there was something else taking place. And a verse that comes to my mind in James chapter 2, verse 18, or outside of verse 17, it says, Even so faith, if it has not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. The devils also believe, and they tremble. So it's kind of like faith is God's way of saying, Do you really trust me? Like, do you really believe that what I'm saying is actually for your benefit? Do you really understand the person who I am? Because it's interesting how God used a comparison in Hebrews 11 with creation. I mean, he speaks and nature obeys immediately. Nature is not an intelligent reasoning um, thing, you know? But human beings, we intelligently have to respond to God. God could easily command his word and we could stand up and do it immediately. But God is like, do they understand what it is that I'm actually trying to say? Or are they just doing something out of fear? Or are they doing this because, you know, they actually know who I am? So it's kind of like it's pleasing to God when we understand and say, Lord, you're a God of love. I want to trust you and I want to go forward. And in mm -hmm. a situation where I don't see how this really makes sense, in the past I see how you work. So I think I'm going to go forward this time too. Mm -hmm. Kevin, and then we're going to kind of wrap things up. I think there's a stigma around f the word faith that means that people think you don't have to, um, that faith is something without evidence. It's something you have to believe in and exercise without a base. 
Blind faith. Yeah. Blind faith. And yeah. that's, I believe there's a stigma around that, especially in uh, evolutionists, and that's what they think of, right? Mm -hmm. Along with, and so, but in the very definition, we, it's so beautiful because we can see that faith is based off of evidence. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the evidence of things we don't see. And so really a, the best definition is that we use faith to, to believe in, like it's faith, actual faith is, is a, a precise <clears throat> mathematical prediction of what we don't see and saying this is actually what we don't see and this exists because of, because of the things I do see. Because of the things I do see, I realize that what I don't see exists and um, with that definition, then it's so much easier to exercise faith because what we, what we realize that we're doing is not, um, that it's based on what we're, what we, the evidence we see around us. And so if an evolutionist, evolutionists claim they do not have faith, and so I agree with them because they're not based on evidence. Um, and so I, I think you could point that out to them as, as far as, not as an argument, but as a, um, as a way of saying faith is not what you think it is. Let me use, um, let me use uh, an illustration from something we were talking about in class this past week. It, in the class prophetic guidance, we were talking about the difference between certainty and faith. What would be the difference? And uh, to illustrate it, let's imagine that I'm coming to visit Washita Hills for the very first time. And my good friend, Dr. Kathy, is the one that meets me, you know, right here at the front, uh, the entrance to the building. And she says, Sam, good to see you. Uh, let me acquaint you with, you know, the building and things that are going on here. Let's go on inside. And I fold my hands at the entrance there and I say, no, I don't think so. And Dr. Kathy says, come on in, what's, what's the matter? And I were to say, well, how do I know this building is not gonna fall in on me? How do I know that I have permission to go in there? How do I know that if I go in there that I'll be able to see my way around? How do I know? You see, there are so many questions, so many things that we do on the basis of faith. That is, not certainty. Certainty would be that somehow I test everything to see if the structure is sound, right? That's certainty. Faith is, I trust your judgment on it, your experience with it. And so when it comes to the Word of God, Imagine how limited we would be if we always acted only on the basis of certainty and not on the basis of relational, trusting faith. Mm. faith. Yes. I was going to say, I think that's the whole purpose of the Bible. Because in John chapter 17, verse 3, it says, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And when you go back to the beginning in Genesis, everything was perfect. And things broke down when Adam and Eve distrusted God. And so the whole revelation of God's word is meant to restore a trust in him. And so that's why faith is necessary, because the purpose of God in giving us his word is to get us to trust him. And that's what faith is. Step by step, evidence by evidence, it gives us a base to move towards the next step where we can't clearly see our way through, but we can trust the one who is communicating with us. Praise the Lord. Any closing thoughts? Anyone? Okay, so there you have it. We have an understanding, at least kind of a picture of how this works, the Holy Spirit's engagement in it, prophets, but God wants to communicate his word to only the prophets? No, he wants to communicate to all of us as well. And you know, I'm encouraged by the thought that if we dedicate ourselves as well, deeper and deeper ways daily, 
we'll hear more from God ourselves. Amen. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's close with prayer. Living God and Father, thank you for this beautiful process. We're grateful that there are those who are so close to you that you can demonstrate supernaturally, relationally, in so many ways you can demonstrate that you are truly communicating through them, the same message, the same heart, um, and, and the same destiny. And Lord, as we uh, receive your word, may your transforming grace bring us closer to you so that day by day we can hear more intimately and more confidently from you as well. It's our prayer in Jesus' name, thanking you. Amen. Thanks for joining us here at Watch Hills Academy and College for our weekend program. We sincerely hope you've been blessed. To keep sharing the good news, be sure to hit that subscribe button and tap the notification bell before you go. Also, check us out on Facebook and Instagram. Links are in the description below. Have a blessed Sabbath.